الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله On one very special day in the streets of Medina our Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم came out and he was wearing a coat made of black wool and then his grandson Hassan came and he entered that coat of his and then Hussein came and entered with him ثُمَّ جَاءَتْ فَاطِمَةَ فَأَدْخَلَهَا And then Fatima came in and also entered with them ثُمَّ جَاءَ عَلِيًّا فَأَدْخَلَهُ And then Ali also came and he entered that coat with them And then the Prophet recited صلى الله عليه وسلم إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ الْيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمْ وَرِجْسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتُ وَيُطَهِّرُكُمْ تَطْهِيرًا Indeed Allah wants to cleanse you from impurities, O Ahl al-Bayt, O household of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and purify you. Hassan and Hussein and Fatima and Ali on that particular day entered that coat of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then the Prophet closed it and then the Prophet recited that verse. The verse in Surah Al-Ahzab, in fact, was revealed concerning the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, who are also members of the house of the Prophet ﷺ. So those household, the Ahlul Bayt, for us, Ahlul Sunnah, are these particular individuals as well as the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. These are the ones. هؤلاء أعلام الإسلام وإيمان الإيمان. الطيبون الأخيار الطاهرون الأبرار الذين أذهب الله عنهم الأرجاس وجاء المودتهم واجبة على الناس These are the ones, my dear brothers, who are like the flags of Islam. Those who are purified and those who Allah removed impurities from and Allah made love upon them and obligation incumbent upon us. And the one of whom we speak today Hussein ibn Ali radiyallahu ta'ala an lahu ma kanatun mutumayyizatun inda al-khawas min ashabi rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who has a very special and dignified position amongst the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for he was the one my dear brothers and as well as his brother Hassan radiyallahu ta'ala an in the hadith in Sahih Muslim when the narrator says laqad quttu bin nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wal Hassan wal Hussein baghlatuhu al-shahba حتى أدخلتهم حجرة النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم هذا قدامه وهذا خلفه. I saw the Prophet on his white mule until he entered until he entered the Prophet's house. With him were Hassan and Hussein, this one in front and that one behind. These were the two children, my dear brothers, who ما ريحان تيم من الدنيا نحدي صحيح مسلم are the beautiful fragrances from this dunya. In the mosque of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, they would enter. And the Prophet in one occasion was during the, the, the khutbah, the sermon, and he came down from his sermon, and he approached both of them, and he raised them up, and he hugged them, and he kissed them, and then he returned to the pulpit, and said, indeed Allah spoke the truth, indeed your, your, your wealth and your children are a fitna for you. These are the ones the Prophet used to chase around the streets of Medina, out of playful merriment. He would chase them around the streets of Medina. These are the ones the Prophet loved in the Hadith Sahih Muslim. Upon occasion, the Prophet was walking the streets of Medina and he was wanting to see Hassan. He had this eagerness and desire. He wanted to see his grandson, the two children of Fatima and Ali. May Allah please with all of them. And he was eager to see them. And he went and he inquired and Fatima was bathing him. 
And when he came out, he came running to the Prophet. And the Prophet ran to him. And the Prophet said, Allahumma inni uhibbuhu fa'ahibbuhu ahba man yuhibbuhu. Oh Allah, indeed I love him. So you love him and love the one who loves him. Oh Allah, I love him. So you love him and love the one who loves him. This is how the Prophet was with them. He would hug them, bring them in, kiss them. He loved them so dearly. These two grandchildren of him, of his, Hassan and Hussein, may Allah be pleased with both of them. The companions of the Prophet, indeed they saw that. They saw the extent of the Prophet's love for these two. And so they would honor them. Like Ibn Kathir relates, وَكَانَ الصِّدِّيقِ يُكْرِمَهُ وَيُعَظِّمُهُ وَكَذَلِكُ عُمَرُ وَكَذَلِكُ عُثْمَانُ And just like that, Abu Bakr would honor them, both of them. And he would give them a high station, a high status, exalt them. And so too would Umar, and so too would Uthman. For they had wonderful things to say. Wonderful things to say about them. For indeed, Abdullah ibn Abbas said, كُنَّا نُشَبِّهُهُ بِرَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وسلم. Indeed, we used to compare Hussein, compare him in his features to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. In that he resembled him. And after the death of the Nabi, they would go to the house of Ali just to have a glimpse of them and see what did he look like. Comparing him to Hussein ibn Ali, may Allah be pleased with him. Abu Huraira would say, may Allah be pleased with him. Wallahi, lo ya'lam al-nas minka ma'alam li hamaluka ala riqabihim. If the people knew about you, what I know about you, they would carry you on their shoulders. They would carry you on their shoulders. And indeed, like Marwan ibn Hakim narrates on the deathbed of Abu Huraira, fi maradihi alladhi mata fi, in the illness that took the life of Abu Huraira, radiyallahu ta'ala an, he says, Wallahi, ma wajadtu alayka fi shay'in mundu istabahna illa fi hubbika al-hasan wa al-Husayn. I did not see in you any, anything in your last moments since the, the morning we got up except you're declaring your love for Hassan and Hussein. Jabir ibn Abdullah would say, Wallahi man sarrahu an yanzur ila rajulin min ahli al-jannah fal yanzur ila al-Husayn ibn Ali fa inni sami'tu Rasulullah yaqulahu Whoever wants to see a man from the men of paradise, let him look to Hussein ibn Ali for indeed I heard the Prophet saying that sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For these two were Sayyidah, Sayyidah Shababi Ahl al-Jannah. The two young ones, the leader of the youth in paradise were these two ones. Amr ibn As, may Allah be pleased with him. Fi zillil Ka'bah, idhr al Hussein, In the shade of the Ka'bah, and he would see Hussein and he would say, Hadha ahabu ahl al-ardi ila ahl al-sama'i al-yawm. This one is the most beloved person on earth to the ones in the heavens today. This was the virtue, my dear brothers, of these two grandchildren of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. مَسَحَ الرَّسُولِ جَبِينَهُ فَلَهُ بَرَيْكٌ فِي الْخُدُودِ أَبَوَاهُ مِنْ عَلْيَ قُرَيْشٍ وَجَدُّهُ خَيْرُ الْجُدُودِ That the Prophet would wipe over his forehead and his cheeks would shine. And his, fa- his forefathers were the best of Quraysh and his grandfather was the best of grandfathers. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa ashabihi wa salam. It was in the 60, 60th year after the migration of the Prophet Sallallahu to Medina, 60 years after the Hijrah, when the letters began to arrive. The letters began to arrive from Kufa in the house of Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib radiallahu ta'ala an. And the letters didn't simply arrive one by one, two by two. They, ar- they arrived in their hundreds. Hundreds of letters are arriving from Kufa into the house of Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib. And all the ones who are sending and penning these letters have a particular request from Hussein ibn Ali. We want you, O Hussein, to come to us in Kufa. And if you came to us in Kufa, we would give support to you. Muawiyah had died, may Allah be pleased with him, two months earlier. And many there were from the people of Hijaz who resented the appointment of Yazid. Those who were in the Sham region, they were already used to leadership from Banu Umayyah, and they were okay with that, essentially. But those in the Hijaz, people like Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Umar, Abdullah ibn Zubair, and the Ahlul Bayt, those contingent around Hussein ibn Ali, refused to give the bay'ah, the oath of allegiance to Yazid ibn Muawiyah. 
And so Yazid would send his governor Walid ibn Utba to Mecca and Medina to force the people, to compel the people to give that oath of allegiance. But they refused. And amongst them who refused was Hussein ibn Ali. He just couldn't stomach the idea of giving the oath of allegiance to Yazid ibn Muawiyah. So Walid ibn Utba is coming back and going, coming back and going, and he has bad news for Yazid because those ones in the Hijaz from the Kibar of the Sahaba are not accepting his rule or his authority. So the people of Kufa then are ever eager and they're sending these letters to Hussein ibn Ali and they want him to come to Kufa so that they can give him authority and they can give him support and Nusra and so on and so forth. What Hussein ibn Ali decides in fact is to send his cousin Muslim ibn Aqil. He says, why don't, this was in the month of Dhul Qa'da, why don't you go to Kufa and you investigate the situation? Is it really true the people, I'm receiving thousands of letters, but is it really true that I have a support base in Kufa? Ali ibn Abi Talib of course moved the center of the Khilafah from Medina to Iraq. And so he had authority there. And they knew of course this is the son of Ali. So in his mind he's thinking, well maybe it is true that the people would want to support me over there. But he didn't take the initial risk. He sent his cousin Muslim ibn Aqil, you go and investigate. Muslim ibn Aqil, he leaves in the month of Dhul Qa'da. And when he goes to Kufa, he discovers that there are thousands of people. Thousands. From 12,000, the number rose to 18,000 people <coughs> who were ready in his eyes and his mind to support Hussein ibn Ali. And they gave this allegiance to Hussein ibn Ali at the hands of Muslim ibn Aqil that if he came here, we would support him and we would assist him and we would make him our leader. So it's good news then from, from that side. Muslim ibn Aqil pens a letter back to Hussein ibn Ali in Medina that we have a lot of people, like 18,000 people who are ready and they would give support to you if you ever came to uh, Kufa. But letters, of course, would take time to arrive. It's like one month's distance between the two. In any case, he sends his letter back to Hussein ibn Ali. And the letter comes back to Hussein ibn Ali, radiallahu ta'ala an, and it's with the good news that we have a big support base in here. If you came, the people would support you. Hussein ibn Ali, radiallahu ta'ala an, decided to leave Medina and go to Kufa and to take his family with him to take his family with him. That was his resolve, that was his desire to do that. In any case, what happens is, when Muslim ibn Aqil had arrived in Kufa, and a lot of people are turning their attention towards this cousin of Hussein ibn Ali, Yazid suspects something. He doesn't know quite what it is, but he suspects something. So as a precautionary step, he decides to replace the governor of Kufa and he was initially Nu'man ibn Bashir, the great companion of the Prophet Sallallahu may Allah be pleased with him, and to replace him with Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. And he was known because Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad was in the army of Ali in the battle of Sifin. And his father Ziyad was appointed as governor of Basra by Ali ibn Abi Talib himself. But he was ruthless and he was cruel. He was ruthless and he was cruel. But he was, he was replacing Nu'man ibn Bashir, who did not want to get involved in this, what he suspected would happen. In any case, on one particular day, this new governor of Kufa, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, this was now in the month of Dhul Hijjah, he goes into the streets of Kufa, and he's wearing an amama, wearing a turban. And he takes the end of that turban and he wraps it around his face. So no one could see who he was exactly. And when he came out, he came out with 17 men. It looked like a prestigious entourage. And the people of Kufa, when they first saw that, they, they thought that must be Hussein ibn Ali, who has now arrived from Medina. And so they went to greet him. Welcome, O grandson of the Prophet. And he was about 55 years old by this time, Hussein ibn Ali. He had grown and the years had passed. And he was a man who had children and family. But still they, 
recognized. So they thought, maybe this is the grandson of the Prophet. So welcome, O grandson of the Prophet ﷺ. But then they realized they had just made a fatal error. They had made a fatal mistake. Because it wasn't Hussein, it was in fact Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad in this cover. What Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad did initially was he sent one of his servants, go to the streets of Kufa, and I want you just to sit and keep an eye on things. Watch who comes in, who goes out. Will there be an entourage like my one that would come in and the people would gather around him, wherever that person is. Where is Muslim ibn Aqil? Where is Hussein ibn Ali? It is your responsibility. Go and find where these people are. One of his servants takes that position for a, for a sum of money and keeps an eye out to see where Muslim ibn Aqil is. He discovers Muslim ibn Aqil is in the quarter of, of, um, of Al-Asadi and in the quarter of Hani ibn Urwa. And he goes back and he reports to Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad that this is where Muslim ibn Aqil is. On one particular day, Muslim ibn Aqil, he, he sends a, a big contingent of people with weapons and they go to that house of Hani ibn Urwa and they encircle it and they want Muslim ibn Aqil to be taken prisoner. When they go in, they discover that Muslim ibn Aqil is not there but the one who is there is Hani ibn Urwa himself and they take him and they take him prisoner. When Muslim ibn Aqil discovers that Hani ibn Urwa has been taken prisoner, he now puts his people to the test. Here you are, O oh people of Kufa, ya Ahl al-Kufa, O oh Kufans, here you are with your claims of support and your claims of allegiance and your claims of power and support and everything else. And here is one of our loyal supporters who has been taken prisoner. And so, he says, I need your help. We will march to the palace of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad and we will request for um, Hani ibn Urwa to be released. We will make that request. And 4,000 people joined him. 4,000 people joined him. And they said, that's a good idea. We will all go and it's likely because we have a big force that Ibn Ziyad would be compelled to release Hani Ibn Urwa. And so he takes that force with him. Ibn Ziyad petitions the tribal leaders, the elders. Go and tell the people. Tell the fathers to dissuade their sons. Tell the mothers to dissuade their sons. And so the fathers are now saying things like, listen, there are enough people with Muslim ibn Aqil. You don't have to put your neck on the line. There are enough people who can support him. The mothers are saying this. The fathers are saying, you wait till the armies of Yazid come from Damascus. And then you have absolutely no chance against those big armies coming from Damascus. There's nothing that you could possibly do in that situation. In the morning, he left with a big contingent of 4,000 people. But that number began to reduce. According to Ibn al-Athir and al-Tabari and the, the, the chroniclers from Ahlul Sunnah, the number was 4,000 in the morning. By the afternoon, it was around 400. By Maghrib time, it was 30. He led 10 people in Salah. By the time the prayer was finished, there was no one behind him. Now what would compel the people of Kufa, who came with all of these big claims and statements of support and sent hundreds and thousands of letters to Hussein ibn Ali in the house of Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib. This is his representative, Muslim ibn Aqil, his cousin. And here he is, the first step, the first rung on the ladder. We need support to bring back Hani ibn Urwa. And from 4,000, they're reduced to nothing. They became observers, my dear brothers. They decided, and they knew, of course, we're not dealing with good people who believe in diplomacy. We're dealing with a ruthless pack of wolves who are more than ready to kill 
and more than ready to imprison. This is who we're dealing with. They became bystanders, my dear brothers. They became bystanders. They saw, they thought to themselves, well, it's okay, because if there's 4,000 of us, maybe he won't need 4,000, maybe he will need 3,800. And so that's minus 200. Or maybe he'll need 3,500, that's minus 500 then. And like that, they're making these excuses in their minds. Maybe other people can do it. Or they have the fear factor. There have been many examples like this in human history. And many a psychologist has tried to understand what is it that would compel a people, rather than taking an active stand, to become passive and to become a bystander. And a lot of the discussions, in fact, from 1964, more than 600 articles, papers have been written to try and understand what is it that would make people like this. And it goes back to a very infamous case in America called the Kitty Genovese case. It's a very tragic case of an of American woman who was walking in the streets on one particular night in New York, and a man was following her. His rationale, as discovered later when he was caught, I wanted to see what it felt like to kill a woman. He was following her. She immediately screamed. A man from one of the apartment windows opens a window, and he says, leave that woman alone. The man then scampered. He went back to his car. He drove off. But that feeling, desire to kill that woman was still building up and burning inside of him. And so he returned within a while and he came back and he finds the woman is still in that isolated, lonely position. And so what does he do? He goes back to her. And again, someone else opens a window and makes some noise or something like this. And he goes back to his car. And he drives off, drives off, but still the fire of passion, the shaitan is compelling him. And he now goes back again to that woman. And she's almost at her doorstep. He finds her again alone. And he stabs her. And then he rapes her. And then he stabs her again and he kills her. There were 38 witnesses to that crime, my dear brothers. There were 38 witnesses to that crime. At certain points during that night, those who heard the screams or they knew a woman was in danger or they knew something was up and they should act, but they didn't. Not one of them decided to call the police, for example. Not one of them went down to assist. Not one of them except the first person who said, leave that woman alone. Rosenthal wrote a book about this called A.M. Rosenthal called 38 Witnesses, the Kitty Genovese case to try and understand what is it that would influence those 38 witnesses who became bystanders in this scenario. And a lot of the things that they would say were things like, we didn't want to get involved in this. Just like the people of Kufa would say, we don't need to get involved in this. In 1903, we turn our attention to the case of an elephant called Topsy the Elephant. An animal, Topsy the Elephant. And they were testing the alternating currents of electricity, of high currents of electricity in those days. And they wanted to test the, the effect on a large animal. And so Topsy the Elephant was electrocuted in front of a crowd of around 1,500 people. And no one said anything. No one intervened. Or we turn our attention to the case in the 1990s of Shanda Shera, an 11-year-old girl who was lured from her home, and then she was taken to a car. In that car were some other girls who were a bit older, and some other boys were a bit older, and they had a personal grievance with her. They took us to a secluded area. They tried to stab her. That didn't quite work. They then took a rope to strangle her. It didn't work. Then they doused her in petrol and set her aflame. There were witnesses to that. There were bystanders from that pack of people who did not consent, who, did not, who thought that was a horrendous thing that was taking place, but they didn't do anything to help. And then those people who committed the murder, they went to tell other people of their friends, we've just done this. Those other people didn't say anything. They went to tell other people then, those people then didn't say anything. 
And like that, there have been so many an example of those who are simply bystanders. We turn our attention to 1993. The photograph of Kevin Carter, iconic. It is difficult to believe people haven't seen that photograph. One of the most iconic, he won the Pulitzer Prize because of the photograph of a Sudanese girl on the floor and a vulture perched next to that Sudanese girl. A lot of people, perhaps most people, have seen that photograph because it's so iconic. Now when you see the photograph, you kind of think, well, maybe she's eating something from the floor. She's not. She's desperate to get back to camp. She's desperate to get back to camp. But the vulture has perched next to her because the vulture assumes she's about to die and it seems as if she is about to die. And perhaps she did die, completely emaciated, thin, famished, with no, no life, no energy, and is on the floor, crouched like this, and the vulture is there. My dear brothers, Kevin Carter took 20 minutes to take that photograph. Why? Because he was waiting for the vulture to spread its wings. He was waiting for the vulture to spread its wings. And he thought in his mind, perhaps if the vulture spread its wings, and it looks like this bestial, and this tiny child is there, it will be the perfect photograph in his mind. Because it will be the contrast between the aggressor and the victim. And that's all he wanted to do. He didn't make any effort to try and help that Sudanese girl. To try and feed that Sudanese girl or to bring her back to safety. He made some effort, however, to repel the vulture, which was a very good thing. But later when he was asked, why didn't he do anything to help? What did he say? I didn't want to get involved. Kevin Carter committed suicide. He killed himself shortly after taking that photograph, when he came back. We don't know why, but in any case, he killed himself. There have been many examples like that. So our point is not simply to talk about a narrative, to talk about a story pertaining to the grandson of the Prophet ﷺ. But what lessons do we learn, my dear brothers? What lessons can we learn? Number one, never ever be a bystander in your life. Never be a person, you know, you know that wrongs are committed in front of you. But because of this apathy, or this weakness, or assumed weakness, you think, well, I can't do anything to help anything. We have this diffusion of responsibility. Just like the people in the story of Kitty Genovese, in thinking, well, maybe someone else will call the police. Maybe someone else will assist her. Maybe I'll just go back to sleep. Right? But we entertain this idea in our minds. Maybe other people will give the sadaqah money to the Muslims who are starving now in Somalia, for example. Maybe others will give and sponsor the orphans of our brothers who are sacrificing their lives in Iraq and Afghanistan or Palestine. Maybe others will do all of these things. Maybe I wouldn't need to do anything because other people will do that because we are an ummah of 1.2 or 3 billion, they say. Or we have this audience inhibition where we think that, uh, you know, even if I wanted to help, I wouldn't quite know how to help. I, I would be embarrassed if, for example, you're walking down the streets if like you're in London or in another place that you're not used to and you're walking the streets and you see a person lying on the floor and you think, well, what do I do? Do I go and say, are you okay? Do I help? Do I call the police? Ambulance? What do I do? And you think, well, you say, entertain these thoughts. Even if I did call the ambulance, they might say, well, where are you, sir? And you say, well, I don't quite know where I am because you've lost your way. I don't know how to check his, his pulse or his heartbeat or do CPR. You you become embarrassed. You think, I wouldn't know how to help him. But there are still many things that you could do in that situation, like calling others who perhaps could help him, or doing something within your capability to help. And that is what is required from us, my dear brothers, to do some things that are within our capability. Not to do the impossible, but there are some things that we simply, simply can do. And not to be those who witness and be bystanders when abuse is taking place in front of us whether it's in the home concerning the domestic environment of, the, of a marital couple, for example, or if it's in the society, or if it's in the masjid, or if it's in the street, wherever it may be, we sometimes see zulam, we see an injustice, but sometimes we don't do anything, we don't say anything, because of these thoughts of fear, and maybe this will happen to me, that will happen to me. Everything is in the hands of Allah. Have tawakkul, لَوْ أَنَّكُمْ تَوَكَّلُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ 
حق توكله ورزقكم كما يرزق الطير تغدو خماصا وتروح بطانا رواه مسلم if you truly had توكل in Allah if you truly had trust in Allah Allah would provide for you like he provides for the birds they leave their homes empty stomach and they return home full stomach that Allah will take care of you and the Muslim is the one who is out there and he wants to help people أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ He's been taken out for nas for people and he commands good forbids evil this is an evil and he believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Muslim ibn Aqil is by himself in the streets of Kufa and all of his supporters have deserted him what does he do? he walks around he's trying to evade people like the authorities if you want to call them that who, who want him to be taken to Ibn Ziyad he finds one home, he knocks on the door, an old woman answers the door and he simply says, I'm very thirsty, I need water. Is there any water for a guest, please? And so she brings him in and she gives him some water and she asks, or inquires about him and she realizes this is Muslim Ibn Aqil and she's overjoyed that we have someone in our home from the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We are Kufans, they're Kufans, they're far. They're not that close, they don't quite know. And they're coming late. But to have in your home someone from the family of the Prophet ﷺ, for her it was an honor. And she was so eager for her son to return home, so she could share the good news with her son. We have someone in our home from the family of the Prophet ﷺ. Not knowing of course her son was treacherous. For when that son did come home, and she shared that great news with him. The son had one thing in my mind. You wait till the morning, I will be first thing out of bed, and I will run to the fort of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, and I will inform him where Muslim ibn Aqil is, and I will take a payment for that. Muslim ibn Aqil was there. Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad sent a very, very big force of people, and they encircled that house of that woman, and he was brought out and he was arrested and he was taken to the fort of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyan. It was on in the month of Dhul Hijjah, on the 9th of Dhul Hijjah, on the day of Arafah, on the day of penance, on the day of repentance, on the day of forgiveness, that Ibn Ziyad executed both Hani ibn Urwa and Muslim ibn Aqil and decapitated them. In, the, in his own fort. Hussein ibn Ali has no idea what's happening in Kufa. But before Muslim ibn Aqil had been arrested, he did write a letter back. In the Ahl al-Kufa, كذبوني وكذبوك The people of Kufa, they lied to me and they lied to you. And he's telling him, don't come. But he never receives that letter. He leaves for Kufa on the 8th of Dhul Hijjah. And Muslim ibn Aqil and Hani ibn Urwa are killed on the 9th of Dhul Hijjah. And he has no idea what's happening. But before he leaves, because the news has now reached the other great companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, they come along. Abdullah ibn Abbas. Yabna'am. Look, my dear cousin. إِنِّي تَصَبَّرْ وَلَا أَصْبِرْ وَإِنِّي لَخَائِفٌ مِنْ هَذَا الْوَجْهِ الْهَلَاكِ I can't even be patient. I'm struggling. And I am fearful about this disastrous decision of yours. I'm fearful. Who's fearful? The Sahaba. The companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wa Ashabihi Wa Sallam. Not that they were enemies, but they were those who loved these two grandchildren of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Sallam. I am fearful. In the Ahl Iraq, Umun Ghadda, the people of Iraq are treacherous. They will betray you. They betrayed your father, Ali ibn Abi Talib. But he says, Ibn Am, inni la alam anna ka shafiq. I know that you are a good advisor. To me, I know that. But I have made my decision to go. 
And I'm confident the letters come back from Ibn Aqil and he says there are a lot of supporters and I will take my family and you know, I don't think anything will happen to me. He says, Ya Ibn Am, my cousin. In kunta wala buddha sa'ira fala tasirbi awladik wa nisa'ik if you are truly adamant in going, then don't go with your women and your children. فَإِنِّي لَخَائِفٌ أَن تُقْتَلْ كِمَا قُتِلَ عُثْمَانِ ابْنِ عَفَّانِ وَنِسَائِهِ وَوَلَدِهِ يَنْظُرُونَ إِلَيْهِ Because I'm fearful you will be killed like Uthman was killed and his women and his child are looking at him. Who comes then? Abdullah ibn Umar. Or Abu Sa'id al-Khudri comes next actually. رضي الله تعالى عن He said, look, Hussein, I will tell you something. إِنِّي سَمِئْتُ أَبَاكَ يَقُولُ Me, I heard your dad say. Who was his father? Ali ibn Abi Talib. I heard your father say, these people, the ones who say that they will support you, وَاللَّهِ مَا لَهُمْ نِيَاتِ وَلَا عَزْمْ أَلَى أَمْرِ وَلَا صَبْرْ أَلَى الصَّيْفِ these people who claim that they support you, they have no resolve and they have no patience with the sword and they will betray you. They will betray you. But still Hussein ibn Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, is confident about his decision. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri then leaves. Who comes next? Abdullah ibn Umar. Astawdi'ak Allah min qatil. I, I bid you farewell. I, I wish you the protection of Allah from being killed. But he was, new, he was fearful and he almost knew. He had this very strong belief that Hussein is not going to come back alive. And those companions who were old and they were experienced and they knew the situation and they lived with Ali ibn Abi Talib with Hussein's father and they were close to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They're advising him, don't go to Kufa. But still, may Allah be pleased with him, Hussein ibn Ali, he went along with his family, 72 of them, women and children and some supporters. And he goes to Kufa. When he arrives in Kufa, he discovers that there is no Muslim ibn Aqil. He died a long time ago. There is no Hani ibn Urwa. For he has also died a long time ago now. And where are those 18,000 people from the people of Kufa who claimed that they would support him? Where have they suddenly all vanished into thin air? Where are those, where is that 18,000 people's support for Hussein ibn Ali and Muslim ibn Aqil? For he couldn't see it anywhere. And people went back to their homes. And here he is, the grandson of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa The only living grandson of a prophet alive. And he's stranded. And so he has three claims, three petitions. He says to them, look, I'm happy to go back. I will go back to Medina. Or, I will fight fi sabilillah in one of the frontier lands of Islam and I will die like that, killed shaheed by the permission of Allah. Or, allow me to go to Yazid himself and I will petition my claim to him. They refused, rejected all of them. Neither will you go home, neither will you leave this vicinity and nor will you have a chance to go and meet Yazid yourself. Because they wanted to compel him to give that bay'ah, that oath of allegiance to Yazid ibn Muawiyah. Yazid, he sends, sorry, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, his governor in Kufa, sends an army headed by Hur ibn Yazid. Not Yazid ibn Muawiyah, but Hur ibn Yazid. An army of 1,000 to go and compel Hussein ibn Ali to give that bay'ah for Yazid. But Hur ibn Yazid, he was made of a different kind of substance. For indeed when he went to Hussein ibn Ali, he kind of kept the distance from him. He tried his best not to get too close to him. 
he would follow him. If he went right, he went right. If he went left, he went left. But still, he would keep a bit of a distance from him. Until he spoke and said, Oh Hussein, do not make Allah test me with the family of Muhammad wasallam. Do not make Allah test me with the family of Muhammad wasallam." Hussein ibn Ali says, May your mother be bereaved of you. May your mother be bereaved of you. Hur ibn Yazid says, you know, if it was anyone other than you, I would have taken revenge against you. But what can I say about your mother when she is Sayyida to Nisa al Alami? <laughs> what can I say about your mother, Fatim bint Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa when she is the leader of the women, of all the women, and one of the four of Fatima, Asya, Khadija, and Maryam, the leaders of the women in Jannah. What can I say about your mother? And Hurib and Yazid, you know, he had a disinclination. He didn't truly want to be part of that thing, but it was so difficult for him to break ties completely. And Ibn Ziyad sensed that. And so he sent a larger force of 4,000 people headed by Umar ibn Sa'ad. You go. And you know if you don't go, then these lands of yours that I'm giving to you, like iqta'ad, land grants for you, they will go to others like Shimr ibn Dhil Joshan and other people. They were happy to do my work and to take the land. If you don't go. And here you have those who will do the evil commit the injustice because of promises of dunya because of promises of dunya we will have dunya we will have peace who cares if you don't have peace we will have safety and peace and aman and a good night's sleep I don't care too much if you don't have a good night's sleep and peace and aman and safety and so he was happy to do the deal. And he goes off with his army of 4,000 people. Hussein ibn Ali is stranded. He can't leave because Ibn Ziyad is blocking the routes. And he's enclosing Kufa. So it's difficult for people to come in and it's tough for them to go out. But he's trying to allow them a few days, extra days. He's taking advice from those who are with him. What is it that I'm supposed to do in this situation? But also strengthening them. For here they are in the Sa'atul Usra. Here they are in the tough hour. In the hour of difficulty, in the hour of hardship. What do you do? Until the forces of Ibn Ziyad are mounting up. Another 1,000 of Hussein Ibn Numair. Another one. And then another 1,000. Then 4,000 of Umar Ibn Sa'ad. Thousands of people are preparing for this encounter with what? A group of 72 people? Among some women, among some children? And at the head of all of them, the grandson of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And how could that happen? And how could that happen? So Hussein is preparing his people, but he knows that it can't end except with, we will have to defend ourselves. Not that we will engage any fighting with anybody, because Muslims don't fight other Muslims, Muslims don't kill other Muslims or spread other Muslim blood, but we are on the defensive here. We are not doing anything wrong here. And he's reminding his people. And he's telling again and again to people like Qurib and Yazid and the others, I simply allow us a chance to go back or to go and fight in the frontier lands or to go and speak to Yazid. They're not allowing him to do that. Until it comes to the ninth of Muharram. And he realizes, look, there is going to be no more extension to our days. They won't have patience anymore. They're ever eager to engage in us in battle. And so he speaks to his people. In advice, truly, if you think about this, Ibn al-Athir relates, and others relate, Ibn Kathir. This is the advice he gave his people. And these are his words. On the ninth, on the night before martyred in the land of Karb, Karbun wa Bala'un, 
in the land of hardship, Karbala, he began, Uthni Allah ahsan al-thana, wa ahmaduhu ala sarra'i wa darra'a, Allahumma inni ahmaduk, ala an akramtana bin nabuwa wa allamtana al-Qur'an, wa ja'alta lana asma'an wa absaran wa af'idah, faj'alna laka min al-shakirin. He began by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For all praise is due to Him. And by thanking Him and praising Him, whether in the hardship or in the ease, whether in those days of relaxation or in those days of hardship. Ta'arraf ila laif al ya'rifka fi shidda, o kama qal sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Know Allah in the ease and Allah will know you in hardship. Know Allah in the ease. In your days of ease when you have some money in your pocket and you have some good health and the world seems fine to you, that is when you make more remembrance of Allah and you increase in your worship and you increase in your good deeds. Not that you become heedless, ghafil, forgetful. If you want Allah to know you, be with you, support you in your days of hardship, be then like that. And he said, Oh Allah, Indeed, I praise you in the hardship and the ease. And I praise you that you made us from this family, the head of whom was the Prophet. And blessed us with prophethood, this family, this ummah. And you taught us Quran. You taught us Quran. The advice of Jundub al Bajali, radiallahu ta'ala, and all seekum bi taqwa Allah wa all seekum bil Quran. فَإِنَّهُ نُورٌ بِاللَّيْلِ الْمُظْلِمِ وَهُدًا بِالنَّهَارِ I instruct you with the taqwa of Allah and with the Qur'an. Because Qur'an is your light in your dark night. Because the Qur'an is your light in your night of darkness and it's your guidance in the day. One of the things that our brother Muslim begged from Guantanamo Bay said that it was true that almost everyone that I was with in Guantanamo Bay in those years memorized Quran and the only thing that was familiar to us everything is unfamiliar there is nothing that resembles life of normality in that place nothing not the clothes you wear, not the people you see, not the air you breathe, not the food you eat, nothing. Except one thing, and that is Qur'an. The only thing that we saw that was familiar was the sound of the Qur'an that does not change. And it would start from one end and they would recite one ayah. And then the next one would recite the other ayah from his cell. And then the third and the fourth and the fifth until at the end the last one has it. And they would memorize the Qur'an. The story of our dear sister. I've even forgotten her name. But the story was so well known of the, of the sister from Misr from Egypt. The one who... Zainab. Zainab. <laughs> Not Zainab al-Ghazali. Not the one who was martyred in those days. May Allah have mercy on her soul. But the young small sister who memorized Quran and she and her parents would make effort with her to, to teach her Quran. They left that as a gift for her. But one day the news arrives, reaches them that the mother has cancer. The girl's mother has cancer. But the father kept that information from the young girl because she was too young to understand the ramifications of that. He kept it from her. On one particular day when the father went to visit the mother, his wife in hospital, he opened his car door, he came out and a car ran over him. And he was killed in front and the witness was the girl. And she was completely orphaned. She had no mother, no father. You must have heard her story because she recited Quran and all these Arabic stations. And her story was, you know, people would cry in thinking of her story of a young girl 
whose mother and father have both died. But the one thing by which we recognize her and know of her is the fact that she had Quran in her heart. That is the advice of Jundub al-Bajali. Hussein ibn Ali is telling his people, do not forget the blessing. We are still from the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we have the Quran. And we thank Allah that Allah gave us asma'an wa absaran wa af'idah. Allah gave us hearing and seeing and heart, my dear brothers. Bakr ibn Abdullah would say, rahmatullah alayhi, in kunta ta'rif, if you wanted to know, qadra ma annam Allah bihi alayk fa ghammid aynayk. If you want to see the power or the value of Allah's favor upon you, close your eyes. That's it. That's it. Just close your eyes. And you try and live in that darkness for the next five minutes. And then you open your eyes and you think, Subhanallah, how thankful must I be? You see, it depends on how you understand it, how you understand the blessing. I once saw an advert, you know, of a man who was, it was an, an advert, but it had a very good message of a man who was in the street and he was blind. And he had a placard next to him that read something like, I am blind, please give generously, something like that. And people are walking past and they're giving a 1p or a, you know, very small money, 5p, 10p, 20p, not much currency, not much money. And he's still sitting there, but he can't see what on earth is happening because he's blind. Until another person comes past, he doesn't know who that person is. We don't know because it's just an advert, commercial. And the person takes the placard, turns it around, takes the marker pen, and writes something else on it, then puts it down. We don't know what that person has written, but all we see is that people are walking past and now they're dropping their pounds and two pounds and five pounds and ten pounds and twenty pounds. Big money, a lot of money. And the man doesn't understand what has happened. What has created this sudden, su sudden surge of people who want to give to me and, and help me in this difficulty of mine? And all the person returns, the one who did that for him, and he asks, what did you do with my placard? What did you write on it? And they say, nothing. I didn't do anything except that I framed it a bit different. And then we all get to see what is written on that placard. It doesn't say, like it said in the first place, I am blind please donate generously, but it said instead, it is a beautiful day today, but I can't see it. That's all it said. It is a beautiful day today, and the sun was shining, but I can't see it. And then people understood. That is true. And that is why we must give. So think then about your blessings. He's reminding them, like Ibn Qayyim says, Shukr al-Am and Shukr al-Khas. Shukr al-Am al-Mat'am wal-Malbas wal-Mashrib al-Quwwat al-Abdan. The general shukr that you make is for your limbs and for your uh, food and for your drink and for the strength of your limbs. Wa shukr al-Khas al-Iman wa Tawheed wa Quwwat al-Qulub. And the specific shukr is for your Iman and your Tawheed and the strength of your heart. He's teaching them both of these. Remember this and also remember that. Remember the most important, but remember the one after that as well. He says to his people, look. I think our day with the enemy will be tomorrow. I think our day with the enemy will be tomorrow. This night has now come upon you. So make it beautiful. <laughs> this night has now come upon you. So make it beautiful. And show some degree of brotherhood and affinity for one another. Take the hands of one another. Have this resolve in yourselves. We didn't come here to cause an aggression. But they refuse us to go back. And they're bent on warfare. They're bent on killing us. What else can we possibly do? But he says to them, look. In essence, they're not after any of you except they're after me. 
فَانْطَلِكُوا فِي حِلْ فَلَيْسَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِنِي ذِمَامٍ You know, I, I am not holding you here. You're all excused to go back home. All of you. I will never hold that against you. And they said, لِمَا نَفْعَلْ هَذَا لِمَا نَبْقَى بَعْدَكَ Why would we do that? And why, we should, why would we remain after you? وَمَاذَا نَقُولَ النَّاسِ And what would we say to the people? تَرَقْنَا شَيْخَنَا We left our shaykh and we left our leader and the best of our cousins that we left you? Is that what we would say to the people when they ask, why did you leave him alone in the land of Karbala by himself? No. They said, we will fight with you. He says, I have not found the people who are more ufa or more loyal than I found in you, small contingent of 71, 72 people. And they all remained with him. The next day, the army of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad had prepared itself. But so too did Hussein ibn Ali prepare himself. It was not like as depicted sometimes, it was a complete slaughter of people and you know it was like the sacrifice or something like this there is a danger and you can see it without even having to perceive it with depth a similarity between those nasara those christians who made isa alayhi salam the rule because they saw in him an exception and those who make hussein ibn ali a rule because they see in him an exception Almost identical. Almost identical. Those who turn the exception in their minds, Isa alayhi salam could do wonderful things and wonderful miracles and he could bring the dead back to life with the permission of Allah and, and, and so on. And his birth was miraculous. He didn't die. Allah raised him miraculously. And in all of this, although the Christians believe he was killed, but he was not وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَا لَهُمْ But the idea is, they make that exception and turn it into the rule. It all begins from that point onwards. Those who see Hussein ibn Ali can astain. But they turn Hussein ibn Ali into the rule. And so he was preparing his people. He told them to fight bravely. He told them to hold their swords correctly. He told them to have courage and spirit and to fight as warriors do, as lions do. Ibn al-Adhir has a narration from one who was a witness to that on the other side of the fence. Who said, I have not seen a person more bereaved of his women and his children and still fight more bravely than I saw Hussein ibn Ali on that day. And as they go out to fight, the first one who is killed is Muslim ibn Awsaj al-Asadi. Muslim ibn Awsaj al-Asadi, one of the greatest of the supporters of Hussein ibn Ali. And he is the first one to lose his life. Hussein ibn Ali runs to him and says, Glad tidings to you for your fighting in defense of the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His children come out. Ali Akbar, he comes out to fight, he loses both of his hands. His family, amongst them were children called Abu Bakr and Umar which goes against the narrative of those who think that there was some perpetual enmity and some polarization between these people no, the companions of the Prophet loved the Ahlul Bayt during times of drought during times of drought when the Prophet ﷺ would make dua for them after he died وسلم, Umar became Khalifa when Umar was Khalif, the second Khalif who would he go to? and petition to pray, the istisqa, the prayer for rain, who would he go to out of all the people he could choose? He would go to Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, because of his connection to the Prophet, and because of his closeness to the Prophet. It is not as if they hated the Ahlul Bayt, wa na'udhu billah min thalik. No, they love them. They love them. And so, they were, and so they were going one by one. They blocked the Euphrates River. There was no water that was coming in. But one thing that they don't tell you is that when Hussein ibn Ali is given the information that there is no water, 
Hussein ibn Ali told the, the man, take 10 of you and go and fight the people for that water. Take 10 of you and go and retrieve the water and fight the people for that water. It was not as if they were simply sacrificing, ransoming, sacrificing their lives and said, we're not doing anything. No, they actually fought and they fought bravely. But one by one, they're being killed. One by one, they're being killed. One after the other. The women are still remaining behind in the tents, but they're witnessing all of this. And Ali Asghar was ill on that day and he was spared, but he was in the tent. And they're seeing all of them. Until at the end, the only one who is remaining is Hussein ibn Ali radiallahu ta'ala an. And he has his child in his arms called Abdullah. But they had no pity and they had no mercy. And they killed that child, that baby. And then they struck Hussein ibn Ali. And there were more than 60 stab wounds in the body of the grandson of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. More than 60 stab wounds. And the ones who were specifically responsible were the three. Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, the governor of Kufa, Sinan ibn Anas al Nakhai, and Shimr ibn Dhil Joshan, who went to him and had his knees on him and cut off his head. Decapitated him, cut off his head, and then took him by the hair and began to take that around the field, around the plain of Karbala. Around the plain of Karbala. And then Ibn Ziyad commanded to send the horses to trample over their bodies. To trample over their bodies. And to put these heads on poles. And to take these poles so people could see this is the power of tyranny. This is the power of tyranny. This is barbarity. Zayd ibn Arqam was in Damascus. Sorry, Zayd ibn Arqam was not in Damascus. He was in Kufa. Radiallahu ta'ala an, that companion from Dar al Arqam. The first house which the Prophet would go to and the Prophet would learn. The Prophet would teach his companions and revelation would descend and he would teach his companions in that small house. It was the house of Arqam. Now he's an old man, very, very old. And he says, Shahid to Ibn Ziyad, because that head of Hussein is taken to uh, Ibn Ziyad. And he says, I witnessed the head of Hussein Ibn, Ibn Ali when it's taken to Ibn Ziyad. And I saw Ibn Ziyad who had a stick and he began to beat those lips of Hussein ibn Ali with that stick. And so he speaks and he says, Wallahi by Allah, لَقَدْ رَأَيْتُ شَفَتَيْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ أَلَا هَتَيْنَ شَفَتَيْنْ فَبَكَى Indeed by Allah, I saw the lips of the Prophet on those two lips which you're beating, kissing them. I saw the lips of Rasulullah on those two lips of Hussein ibn Ali, kissing them, and he began to weep and he began to cry. That was the ghulam, that was the injustice that took place on that particular day. But the people of Kufa had a lot to answer for. And even from the books of the Shia, there is an acknowledgement of this. Not that we read their books or rely on their books or anything like that, but simply there is an acknowledgement. When, when Ali Asghar, when he sees the people and they're crying and they're weeping, Sah, ya ahl al Kufa. Yes, O people of Kufa, this is how it is that you kill your men and then your women weep. أَلَسْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ أَنَّكُمْ كَتَبْتُمْ إِلَىٰ أَبِي Do you not know that you people wrote to my father telling my father to come to Kufa? And then when he came, you deserted him and you killed him and you betrayed him. But when Zainab, the sister, as 
goes back to Medina from our accounts, from our sources, and goes to Baqiyah. He says, ماذا تقول إن قال النبي لكم ماذا فعلتم وكنتم آخر الأمم بأهل بيتي وانصاري وذريتي منهم أسار وقتل ضرج بدمي ما كان ذاك جزائي إذ نصحت لكم أن تخلفون بسوء في ذوي رحمي What will you say if the Prophet asks you what did you do with my family? Amongst them are those who are imprisoned and others are killed and the blood is flowing. That was not the way that you repay him back, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Khalid ibn Ghufran, one of the greatest of the tabi'een, comes out, جَاءُوا بِرَأْسِكَ يَبْنَ بِنْتِ مُحَمَّدْ مُتَزَمِّلًا بِدِمَائِهِ تَزْمِيلًا فَكَأَنَّمَا بِكَ يَبْنَ بِنْتِ مُحَمَّدْ قَتَلُوا جِهَارًا عَمِدِينَ رَسُولًا They came with your head. O oh, the son of the daughter of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and the blood was flowing everywhere. They came with your head, O oh, the son of the daughter of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and here they killed you in complete obstinacy with defiance of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa What do we learn, my dear brothers? Because there has to be a lesson that we can learn, otherwise what, the, the talk becomes redundant and pointless. We are not of those, my dear brothers, who simply become emotional and we, like some people do, who beat themselves. And look at the striking irony here. There is a striking, almost a stinking irony here in the fact that, look, people are happy and ready to spill their blood on the streets by cutting themselves and beating themselves and cutting their skins and cutting their heads and all of this. But one of the lessons you learn from the story of Hussein ibn Ali is the fact that there were bystanders who didn't do anything. There are people in the world who don't have blood and need blood. There are people in the world who don't have blood. And there are blood banks where people go and donate their blood to save other people's lives. And here you have a people who would prefer to cut their skins and spill their blood on the streets for no purpose. That would not help anybody if you did that. But if you had any sense, perhaps use that blood that you're spilling and go and donate it to a people who do need that blood. So we are not like that. And nor do we understand this episode in a dramatic frame, as some people do. So they take this narrative and every year they recount it. Every year they recount it. Every year and then they bring the weepers with them. And they bring the lights with them, and they bring the horse, and then they decorate the horse, and they bring the children, and then they put on their clothes a specific attire, and then they bring the fake blood, and they put it on the horse, and then they bring the music, and all these things. So that something that may have been true in the beginning, by the time it's finished, it's, it's turned into some fictitious narrative. With so much hyperbole, with so much exaggeration that it's hard to see, well, what exactly actually did happen. Alhamdulillah, that we do not have that problem. That we don't have that. We don't see the world like that. That we would need to add to and we would need to make, exaggerate these kind of claims. No. What took place was a dhulam, was an injustice. And it was a terrible crime and injustice. What do we learn from it? Number one, my dear brothers, do not think, that the ones who are entitled to the Ahlul Bayt are the Shia. If you think this, then there's a big problem. If you think that we cannot speak about the Prophet's family because speaking about the Prophet's family would be incorrect or something like that, that is completely wrong and incorrect. This is a family of the Prophet. Just like there are companions, this is the family of the Prophet ﷺ. We speak about all of them. All of them. We do not pick and choose who we speak of. We should not feel ashamed or feel fearful or anything like that. Because we love all of them. Like Imam al-Shafi'i would say, Rahmatullah alayhi, Ya ahla bayti, Rasulillah yuhubbukum, fardun min Allah fi al-Quran anzalahu, yakfikum min azim al-fakhri annakum man lam yusalli alaykum la salata lahu. O oh, family of the Prophet 
love for you is an obligation upon us. It is enough with the greatest of pride, whoever does not send salutations upon you, he has no salah. So we say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim innaka hamidun majeed. We send salam to the Prophet and to the family of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Number two, we learn the lesson never to be like the people of Kufa, never to be the bystanders, never to be those who betray, never to be those who are treacherous, but to be those who are people of honesty and who stick to our word when we make those words. Not to be treacherous and hypocritical. We learn the lesson never to be of those. When we see an injustice and we are in a position of capability of doing something to rectifying that and righting the wrong, that we make that commitment within ourselves. If I was to see something like that, I would do something to assist. Something to assist. If I cannot do it myself, I will go and call people to assist me in doing that. But I will not simply walk past. A.M. Rosenthal's last sentence in his book pertaining to the case of Kitty Genovese is this. He says, and fear the witness that lies within who whispers to close that window. Because that is what happened with those 38 witnesses. Each one saw, each one closed his window. But that is then shaheed. That is a witness. And that is true. Allah will ask us about all things on the Day of Judgment. One of the biggest things is about issues pertaining to ghulam. As we learned just yesterday about wrongs and injustices against other people. May Allah make us of those who are true, my dear brothers. I want to end with the words of a poem. I want you to listen to the poem and try and understand the implications of this poem. It's a poem written about injustice in Africa. And it goes like this. They picked Akani up one morning and beat him soft like clay. They picked Akani up one morning and beat him soft like clay. And stuffed him down the belly of a waiting jeep. What business of mine is it? So long they don't take the yam from my savoring mouth. They came one evening and dragged Dan Laddie out, then off. Then off to a lengthy absence. They came one evening and dragged Dan Laddie out, then off to a lengthy absence. What business of mine is it? So long they don't take the yam from my savoring mouth. Chin we went to work one day, only to find her job was gone. Chin we went to work one day, only to find her job was gone. No warning, no query, no probe. Just one neat sack for a stainless record. And then one evening, as I sat down to eat my yam, a knock on the door froze my hungry hand. The jeep was waiting on my bewildered lawn, waiting, waiting in its usual silence. The moment you turn your back, perhaps you will meet the same very end. The moment you witness people who are victims of, it, of an injustice, perhaps one day you too will be the victim of an injustice. And just like you turned your back on someone at one point, maybe there might come a time where other people would turn their back on you. The same way that you entertain this idea, well, other people can do it, I don't want to get involved. Maybe other, another, another situation, when you are in a plight-stricken state, other people would think the same thing. You know, I don't need to because other people can do it. No, the Prophet taught us like this and learn it like this. When he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Wallahu fi awni al-abd, ma kan al-abdu fi awni akhi. Allah is in the support of his servant, as long as that servant is supporting his brother. May Allah make us of those who support one another. May Allah make us of those when we see an injustice, a ghulam, we are of the first to do something to assist and to help and protect and prevent. May Allah make us of those who are people of action, and who are active and not passive in our approach towards the things we see around us. May Allah send peace and blessings upon Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa and upon his beloved family and his companions. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Jazakumullah khair.
Okay.